Welcome coaches, welcome players, and welcome parents. I know some of you are probably joining us for the very first time ever. Uh, maybe you were recommended to join tonight's webinar from a coach or from a, a friend you know who's a part of our PGC community. So welcome to all of you. My name is Mana Watsa. I serve as president of PGC Basketball and I'm joined by our Director of Coach Development, TJ Rosine. TJ is the head coach at Emmanuel College. TJ is a three-time National Coach of the Year. He's won national championships. He's been a Coach of the Year at every, uh, at, at every level possible uh, within the game. Uh, Georgia State Coach of the Year, National Coach of the Year, Conference Coach of the Year many times over. And uh, I did, TJ coaches a very successful college program at Emmanuel College in Franklin Springs. And we're just privileged to have you, TJ, as our director of coach development, longtime PGC director as well. And uh, you obviously have just a wealth of experience recruiting players, um, going all the way back to getting recruited as a college player yourself, and now here to share some of your wisdom. So welcome, TJ. Yeah, excited to be here. Excited to maybe help coaches and parents and players maybe navigate this landscape as it uh, has always been crazy, but it's for sure crazier than it's ever been. And it's not an easy thing to navigate. So hopefully we can shed some light on that and, and help some people to have a better understanding. Yeah. So let's go ahead and uh, jump right in TJ, but actually, obviously this is either a pain point or something that everyone's trying to figure out. And I think you're no different as a, as a college coach, you're trying to figure out this changing landscape as well. So I'm just uh, really looking forward to picking your brain, hearing some of, uh, some of the things that you would say. As you know, from members of our PGC family, we have so many dedicated and serious players and parents of players who are hoping to be able to get a college scholarship, who had the same dream that you and I both had because we were both high school players, who were aspiring to play college basketball as well. The landscape, as you said at the beginning, has changed significantly from, uh, from when we were in school. But TJ, let's, uh, let's go ahead and kick it off. So of course, uh, how to play college basketball, more specifically how to get recruited to play college basketball. And let's, let's, talk, uh, let's talk this first one right after right off the bat, how to control the controllables. So what are those controllables that, uh, that a parent and player can control? And coaches, we invite you, we're gonna speak directly to players and parents tonight. Of course, you know, this is for you as well. So just be writing down the best practices that you can take back to your players and parents to help them. So TJ, what are those uh, controlling the controllables that you're referring to? Well, you know, first of all, Mano, there's no magic pill to become a college player. And, and I think the first thing is that uh, you got to be good enough. Like you, you've got to earn the right to be able to get there. And uh, the truth of the matter is there's probably players that are good enough that aren't playing. And you know, that's one of the things we want to talk about is how to help them, you know, get recognized, get seen or help, help them get in touch with the with a college coach, but I think that's the first thing. And, and I think, you know, we've got a little bit of a problem probably in sports in America where we're spending all of our time getting exposed and not enough time getting better. And so this probably hits different for different ages, parents. Um, but one of the things I would encourage them is to control them taking control of their game and, and becoming the best player they can be and making sure that you're getting the right information on how to become the best player. You know, I think that you know, as college coaches, we spend time at uh, high school games, we spend time at AAU tournaments. And, you know, there's, um, there's a lot of players out there that spend a lot of time getting exposed, but not always getting uh, to the level they need to get to. So first of all, figure out how do I get good enough to make sure that I'm college ready? What are the things that I need to be doing? I think that's one really big controllable. I think another controllable is, you know, college coaches look for all kinds of different things. And, you know, it's, it's really kind of shocking to me, you know, how often players don't stand out when you go watch hundreds of players, you know, both of my kids are playing in tournaments this weekend and I'll go out recruiting and I'll see players all over the place. And, you know, we, we teach this at PGC, but it's, 
it's really not that hard to stand out if you're willing to be different. You know, if you're willing to be the most shaped player, and for those of you that have been to PGC before, you know what shaped means and 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 what a shaped player looks like. But you know, if your spirit is is different than everybody else, if your energy, if your hustle, if your communication, you know, most players on the court aren't talking very much. Most players on the court aren't giving a hundred percent hair on fire effort all of the time. So I think controlling those things of being a phenomenal teammate and, and uh, you know, I know those things are talked about a lot, those intangibles, but as a coach, when I see those things, I had a young man the other day that I went and watched at a, at a local high school here. I'm not sure if he's good enough or not. I was debating, but when he didn't shut up for 50 minutes of the workout, I said, I haven't seen that in a workout in three years where a kid didn't shut up. He just kept talking kept encouraging teammates and the whole time. And I, and I went back to my assistant coaches and I said, this is different. This is something that I don't know if he can help us in games. I'm unsure that he's close, but I know he can make us better in practice every day. And so sometimes you can just get an edge by just standing out and controlling things like that. And I think, you know, it's really important for, for players and, and parents talking to players and, you know, coaches teaching those things that players control things that will help them to stand out because, you know, they, they might shoot good, they might shoot bad. And sometimes a lot of coaches were capable of looking past that. If a player stands out in other places, knowing, man, that shot looks pretty good. It just didn't fall today, but all these other things, if nothing else, it's going to get a second look from us. We're going to go watch them again. I, I love that. And I want to unpack both of those uh, a little bit further with you. They're getting good. Uh, before you try and get get seen and the the getting an edge and obviously it's helpful to to do the things that'll give you an edge once you've gotten good but I can't help but think of uh, our local player Jamal Murray who's obviously become a star with the Denver Nuggets and when he attended his first camp with us at um when he was going into ninth grade he had yet to play any AU basketball and then he continued, came back uh, to PGC uh, uh, for his second time. And I grew up playing pickup ball with his dad. And he still wasn't playing AU because his dad said he wasn't ready. He wasn't ready because he knew he had to get better before he tried to get seen. And then, and, and then he had a quick ascent and quick rise because he had spent so much time getting good when he did finally play in 10th grade AU, he was really good. Um, and he had just used all of that extra time to get better and better and better. And it wasn't that he wasn't still playing against good competition because he was playing with older guys in pickup games uh, that, that made up for not playing with good players in AU. Um, so that was one example. The second one was my son. And I've got a really funny story, TJ, because uh, my friend here who runs, uh, runs a really successful basketball program in town used to say he was going to call family and children's services on me for not putting my kids in his program. <laughs> and I said, they're not ready yet. We're, we're just working on them getting good. And uh, anyway, when he ended up playing at the same time, it was the same time as Jamal in 10th grade is when he started playing AU. Well, everyone thought it was gonna be too late because he hadn't played from third grade to ninth grade, uh, but now he's a college basketball player. And so it, it's, it can obviously be, be uh, you know, every parent has to choose for themselves and every player has to choose for themselves. You know, what point in time do you need to kind of get into the system? But I think far too many players try to get exposure um, and try and get seen before they try and get good. And uh, so any additional thoughts on that front? I think I'm coaching a travel team right now with my daughter who's in seventh grade. And, um, you know, I think one of the things that people or one of the things that happens when you're in travel ball is you start doing things that you're maybe not ready to do. And, you know, I played college basketball and one of the best things that my dad ever did for me was have me just shoot inside the paint till I was like sixth grade, seventh grade. And I slowly moved back. And there was a great video with Steph Curry and talking about between his ninth and 10th grade year, when his dad took him back in the gym and scooted him in and kept him in there the entire summer because all of a sudden you start trying to do things to impress people or to keep up with the Joneses that are going to actually hurt your game. And one of the best things that it might have did for my game was keep me in there. And if I would have been playing in games, I probably would have let a bunch of shots ride. And then you have to undo habits. And that's just one example 
of going and doing things that you're not ready to do yet, which is going to probably cause damage uh, to your game. And, and another thing that's happening in a lot of those games, and we talked about it you know, prior, Mono, is, you know, in America, we kind of are run by the almighty dollar of, of basketball. And in foreign countries, they're doing a better job of teaching the game, to be honest mm-hmm. with you. You know, yeah. they're out there and you can't run a ball screen till you know, 14, 15 years old. We see eight year olds running ball screens. And to be honest with you, like it takes a lot of practice time to go out there and teach how to guard a ball screen, which is time that's taking away from your playing player being a better shooter, a better passer, a better teammate, a better whatever, any of those skills, because now you got to teach how to guard a ball screen, which they're not ready and it's not time. And so you start doing things that are actually possibly hurting your game versus actually developing your game. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and actually, we tested the waters and put our, our son in in eighth grade and on an AU team. And he was the eighth man on the team. And I realized this isn't going to be the path that's going to help him get to where he wants to go. So in ninth grade, we pulled him back out and just work, worked on development before we put him into 10th grade. Every Everyone's got a different journey. I'm not suggesting that's the journey for everyone. And like TJ, your daughter's playing in seventh grade. And uh, uh, But I think it's worth considering just how do I get good before I try and get seen? And how do I get so good that there's something that's worth being seen? And I think it's an important consideration and not that it has to be one or the other. If you're in the right program, right school program, right AU program, for example, when I was growing up, we didn't have a strong high school program. I needed my AU program to help me get good and to help me play against better players. So everybody's situation is a little different. I knew I could help my son get good and he didn't have to play AU to get there. And so a little bit different for everybody's scenario, but uh, the principle is a great one. Get good before you try and get seen. The second one is get an edge. Um, Similar to what you said, TJ, I watched a volleyball player play in the Ontario championships, went to watch a family friend and, And I watched a setter who was only about five foot five. And I was just blown away by his leadership. And he played bigger than his size. And even though it was another sport, I was so impressed with him. I shot a Monday mindset. And as you know, TJ, I shoot these Monday mindset videos. I shot a video about his leadership. And it stood out. If I was recruiting him, I would recruit him because of how special those other skills were. And so in addition to getting good, being able to do all of those intangibles that coaches look for. And TJ, why don't we just land the plane on that one? What are a couple intangibles that have stood out to you the most? We tell the story at PGC all the time, of two-time PGC grad Ronald Norred, who became uh, the starting point guard for Butler when they played in the two national championship games. I just went and visited Ronald a couple of weeks ago because now he's an assistant coach with the Indiana Pacers. And Brad Stevens talks about why he recruited Ronald, despite the fact that (laughs) by Brad's uh, own statement, he wasn't a good shooter, he wasn't a great uh, great finisher, and he wasn't even a great penetrator or ball handler, and he still recruited him anyway to a D1 program. So I can share, of course, what, uh, what he saw in Ronald, but what are some of the things that stand out to you? Yeah, I think many of the things that you would talk about in Ronald, I mean, I, the reality of it is I know that not every coach, but I think there's a lot of coaches like myself that want to coach players. They're going to enjoy coaching. You know, it's what we do all year round. It's our livelihood. And when you see a player that smiles and gives high fives and hustles to everything that they do, they play really hard. They have a good motor. Like if they have all of those types of things, You look at a player and say, man, you can't help but to say it. I would like to coach that player. And it's just not many players stand out that way. Now, not a ton of players stand out. There are some players that stand out the other way that says, I would never want to coach that player. But the majority, the 80% there in the middle stands out as somebody that's like, well, it's not that I don't want to coach them. It's not that I do want to coach them. They're just a player. And there's not something that stands out about them. And I think those intangibles you'll talk about at Ronald are the same ones that I'm talking about. There's just a different energy. There's a different vibe. There's a different passion. There's a different, you know, all of those things that, uh, you know, would make your team better, even if they didn't play. Yeah. And TJ, we've never talked about this before, but would you say this is accurate? You know, if, if a player, you've got to be as good as the other players around you uh, to have your special skills stand out. 
if you're a step slower and a step behind everyone else, you can't shoot as well as everyone else, but then you've got those leadership qualities, those intangibles, et cetera. If you're one step down in terms of how good you are, I think you need to be like three steps above in all of those other intangibles. It's not just one-to-one. -one. You can't say, oh, my, my, my kid's slow and doesn't plan and uh, small and not a great shooter, but boy, is he an exceptional or she an exceptional leader. Like they're gonna have to be off the charts to, to make up for being behind on those other aspects. Would you agree? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, look, we're coaching to win. That's our job. Unfortunately, at the college level, I mean, there's coaches that get fired all of the time for not winning. And so we, we definitely need good enough players. But then I think a lot of coaches have been in scenarios too, where they had plenty of good players, but they had really bad chemistry because they didn't have people that led the team and didn't have that. So you, you want a good mix. You want a, a group of players that can play together and you want them to be good enough skill-wise. And so you can't just be a cheerleader and get recruited to college but you can be a solid good player that has a different different attributes to you that are two, three, four levels above everybody else. And you're gonna get an extra look. Yeah. So number one, get good before you try and get seen. Number two, get an edge. Let's talk about the second piece, TJ. Let's jump into levels and fit. And this is the one that I think many parents don't understand. It's one coaches understand, but uh, it's a tough one for parents and, uh, and players to get their minds around. So let's talk about levels and fit and what you see. You've coached at different levels. You've, ha you've had players come to your program from all different levels. W what do you see in terms of levels and fits that would be helpful for our parents and even our coaches to understand? Yeah, and I've and I've played at different levels too. And, and so, I mean, I, I've literally um, done every level of college basketball with the exception of, of division three, which I have a ton of friends that coach division three. So I, I know what all of those up levels look like. And we, we could probably spend a whole webinar breaking that down for, um, for, for coaches and players and parents. I think one of the things that you need to be aware of, and so like there's division one, division two, NAI, um, there's division three, JUCO, um, and there's even, even um, there's prep schools that people go to from high school before they go to college. There's just a lot of different levels that you can play at. It, it, some of the things that are different about them is the number of scholarships that they have. And I think that um, how they do their financial aid. So for instance, if you were just to uh, take like NAI and division two, usually have around, you know, somewhere between eight, 10 scholarships. You look at division one, there's a couple more scholarships um, in there, if you look at Division Three, it's usually no actual basketball money, but they could put really good packages together. JUCO does have a good number of scholarships, um, so there's just a variety of people that give scholarships, don't have scholarships. Some are academic based, and so I'll go into scholarships more in just a second. But I think more just the level and understanding level. I don't think enough people spend time going to watch other games to to see what level do I need to be playing at? You know, I don't think they've seen enough games to know what it's like. You know, was it two years ago, we got the opportunity to play a division one team or a division two team, we beat the division one team. And so what am I looking for? I'm looking for players that can beat a division one team. You know, like that's what I'm looking for. But then a coach could just assume, well, it's not division one, you're looking for that. And division three coaches are thinking, well, I'm not just looking for anybody. They got really good players. There's the division three player that was just at the NBA tryout that might get drafted, that they've got really good players. Every level has got really good basketball players. And so a lot of times not having been to a game, not having to go and watch an NAI, a JUCO, a D2, a D1 or whatever, even there's levels within D1, you know, there's a big difference between a player at Duke and a player at a really small division one school. And, 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 um, and sometimes it's not even the level of skill. Sometimes it's that somebody's 6'10 versus 6'6. Six, six. And so they might be same skill level, but they're dropping down a level because of size. And so there's so many variables that go into it. But what I think is important for parents to know about all of that is, for example, at division two, we have 10 scholarships. We'll break that up over four years. That's two and a half scholarships. So each year, you know, you're not signing 10 new players, you're signing one or two players, you might have a really good point guard, but I might not need a point guard. So there might be zero point guard scholarships at my school. And so the opportunity to get a scholarship is extremely, extremely hard. 
the opportunity to play college basketball, even if you don't have a scholarship, is really, really, really hard. And I'm not sure people understand the bar, what it takes, you know, how do I get seen? That's what we're talking about today. Uh, but I think there's just so many levels to that. And, and one of the things I would advise people to do is go watch some games to kind of get a better grasp of that. Um, but that's kind of a quick overview of the, the difference in levels, Mono. That's, that's really helpful. For, for any, any parent or coach on the call or even some of our international uh, participants tonight, can you just explain JUCO and NAIA? Uh, because everyone's familiar with NCAA and I think they can get division one, division two, II, division three, you know, division one, full scholarships, division two, mostly, uh, most of the players are on scholarship, division three, no athletic scholarships that might be getting academic and leadership scholarships. But what is NAIA and just unpack JUCO, meaning junior college, so that everyone can understand those two. Yeah, I mean, junior college is the two-year college where they do have scholarships. I mean, most of them can put somebody on a scholarship with the hope in two years you're able to go on to another college. NAI has scholarships as well, and it varies usually based on, on institution. Um, but both of them have really high-level players. You know, for instance, a friend of mine won the NAI National Championship this year. And, you know, both of his, he, he ended up uh, leaving that school he's at, but both of his players, one of them transferred to Old Miss, which is in the SEC. And so they had an SEC caliber player playing NAI, right? And, and that happens all the time. There's that level of player. So somebody thinks, well, that level must be pretty low because I don't wait. And look, look at the national championship team. They were good enough to think two of their players could play at power five schools. And so it varies school to school, a number of scholarships where they do have scholarships. And JUCO has a lot of scholarships, to be honest with you. Um, and, and there's a lot of reasons people go is because they didn't quite get what they wanted out of there. They didn't quite have it academically. There's reasons they go. But at the end of the two years, they're hoping to move on to the next scholarship. Good, good. Well said. Let's talk about that that fit piece, because this is a really difficult one. I'm going to go back to my my high school experience, TJ. Uh, so I, I grew up just uh, across the border from Detroit, Michigan, in a small country hockey, baseball, farming community in uh, southern Ontario, Canada, and I had this dream of playing college basketball. In my, going into my senior year in high school, I, I sent out 250 letters to every coach at every level. I don't even know if I've talked uh, told you this story, and uh, I uh, I don't think I mentioned it on our last met webinar. 250 letters to every college, D1, D2, D3, NAIA in the states of Indiana, Michigan, Ohio, Illinois. And uh, in fact, I even, I even got back some letters, some uh, letters from the University of Michigan wrote back to me, please stop writing us. But <laughs> no, they said, you know, we, we finished our recruiting classes from here to eternity. So uh, thank you. Uh, but it was nice to see uh, Steve Fisher, who was the head coach at Michigan, see his signature. Um, he might not have even signed that TJ, but don't break my heart. I think he, I think he signed it. So uh, uh I, I really went after it. I was a 5'11 kid from a small town who just thought I needed an opportunity. And I, I think more than anything else, I wanted to play at the highest level possible. I wanted to play in front of thousands of fans. I wanted to play on TV. I had all of these aspirations. You probably had those aspirations as well. I mean, doesn't every player have those aspirations? And what I just didn't understand and it was a reality check when I actually flew down. Dick DeVenzio, founder of PGC, had what was known then as the Point Guard College camp. And I flew down to Point Guard College. And then two weeks later, I, I flew back down to his national, uh, his national recruiting exposure camp that he put on with 400 top players. And I realized out of 400, I was probably the 399th best player there. I was probably better than one other player and he was injured. So who knows, maybe he wasn't better than me. <laughs> I wasn't better than him. But I say all of that to say it was eye-opening. And from those 250 letters, I got a little bit of interest, but nothing materialized. I ended up finding one coach who saw me play in Canada, who took an interest. I couldn't even get Canadian schools um, interested in me, but found one and I found my home. And I thought my home was destined to be University of Michigan or Michigan State. And my home ended up being a much smaller 
not huge basketball school. And what I found in terms of my fit was A, it was still a huge stretch. Spent my first two years just learning how to play at that level of play. Uh, but then what I discovered was it was actually a much better experience than many of my, my friends who went and played Division I and Division II basketball. So can you just speak to that from your experience? You get transfers coming into your program all the time who have come from D1 schools who found that even though maybe they were experiencing their dream, unless you're playing big time minutes at one of those schools and you're playing under a great coach in a great culture, in a great environment, there's a lot of things that can make it not a great fit. And everyone gets sold on the dream. I was sold on the dream until I experienced a different dream and realized, wow, I may have actually found a, a different and better dream. So talk to us about that, TJ. Yeah, and there's so many levels to that. And the first thing is that's really hard as a parent or as a coach or even as a player to understand to say to an 18-year-old. You know, I went on like 14 Division I visits and I ended up settling on a small Division I. And before I knew it, they got in trouble in NCAA violations. So I went to another small Division I. I was there for a year, it had a really bad experience, decided to go live on a sailboat for a year, didn't even think I wanted to play basketball again. And then I transferred to an NAI where I finished it. And like you found my home, you know, and it was the right place for me. And but I think it's hard for young people to understand. But there is a ton and I have a ton of transfers that have come into us and had a horrible experience at another school. And I've had tons of friends that have played at different levels that have had horrible experience. And I think as a parent and as a coach, we want our, our kids to have really good experiences. And I think it's just as important to find the, the, the right fit, the place that's going to be right for your, for your child or right for you as a player or right for your player. Is it going to be right for you? And, and Mono, um, you have to know yourself a little bit. Like, where, where am I going to go? Like, what is better for me? Would I rather go there? And we have to talk to kids about this all the time. And you sit on the bench and you never play versus you come to this school and you play 30 minutes, what do you want? And I, I can't answer that. Some people that rather sit on the bench at this school, some people would rather play 30 minutes at this, everybody's different. But probably the most undervalued thing in finding the place you wanna play college basketball is what is the right fit for me? Like, where's the place that's gonna be home for me that's gonna grow me into the man or woman that I'm gonna be four years from now? And, and a lot of times we're just driven by, well, who's the biggest and best basketball? But this is a huge life decision and choosing the right fit, talking through that with people that you believe, people that are in your circle, not your height people, right? But the people that you really trust and love to help you find the right fit for yourself. Yeah. And, and, and tell me, with that being said, TJ, I think this stereotype exists in Canada. It certainly did for, for me. Does it exist uh, across the U.S. as well. This might just be a Canadian perspective. You know, for me, it was go big, Michigan, Michigan State, you know, Duke, or uh, not or nothing at all, because you get to a point where you'll take anything. <laughs> but for me, there was almost this, uh, I think now looking back on it, it was kind of an ego pride thing. I put in so much work. I felt like I deserved to play at a really high level. And I felt like I didn't want to have to tell anybody that I was just going to go to the University of Waterloo in Canada or go to a Division II or Division Three school. Does that exist across the U.S. as well? Yeah, and Mono, it's a shame. I'm going to go a level deeper. I can't tell you how many times we reach out to a kid in November, December, and come watch him play. We're super interested. Sorry, coach. I'm probably only you know going to go Division One or whatever it might be. And it's that time of year right now where they're calling us back and we're saying, sorry, we already signed somebody in that spot. And so I think that's important for young people to know, too, is like to leave those options open because you want to talk to everybody. I think that is true. And I think it, it, it wears off when you realize maybe you're not going there. You know, I, same same experience. I remember never forget when North Carolina came to watch me play. And coach came to me after the game and, and I thought, wow, this is going to be my, my opportunity, my moment. And coach said to me, listen, I absolutely love playing, watching you play. I would recommend you to anybody anywhere because of the way that you play the game, but you're not big enough and fast enough for North Carolina. And it broke my heart. You know what I mean? Like it was one of those moments, but 
I, I didn't want to hear that, but I knew I wanted to play college basketball. And I think most people want to, that, uh, you know, especially on the call, their child or them or their player wants to play college basketball, but not knowing the level, not knowing the fit, sometimes we make some mistakes and, and we're not open to looking at everything when we probably want to keep our options open because there's a lot of players who, you know, we recruited that thought and maybe did go division one that are going to call us one year from now and not not to knock division one because there's a lot of good college division one experiences too but one year from now they're going to call us back because they're not happy i mean we talked about this on the last call but we have never seen the transfer portal anything like this i know there's probably over three thousand players in the transfer portal right now and a transfer portal is basically when a kid says i'm at school a and I don't want to be there anymore. They enter their name into the NCAA portal. It says, I'm going to transfer. And we as coaches, we look at it and we get updates every single day on who's in the transfer portal. And at every single level, Division One, Division Two, II, Division Three, there's just thousands of players in the transfer portal, which speaks to the thing before. They may have gone somewhere, but it wasn't the right fit. And they weren't, they didn't maybe figure that out on the front end. And so now they're looking to transfer and that happens all of the time. The transfer portal right now is big in every sport, but it's almost double in basketball compared to any other sport, which is a staggering statistic. Almost twice as many as any other sport players are transferring at a rate higher at, at almost a double the rate of any other sport. So basketball transfers are just happening insanely just at every single level and it's changed the landscape within the last two to three years it's changed the landscape of how we're being recruited so for parents for co for coaches that are on here for players that are on here if we were doing this call two years ago i would be saying different things than i'm saying right now that's how much it's changed in the last two to three years yeah and and i was you, you know you and i have spoken about that tj i was talking with uh, just last week a, a good friend of ours uh, part of our pgc family dean lockwood assistant coach at michigan state and he said that many division one programs half or more of their incoming players uh, across the country uh with D division one programs are from the transfer portal meaning they're not filling spots with high school seniors. And that's really problematic for high school players hoping to play college basketball. So for parents and, and high school coaches on tonight's call who might not be familiar with the transfer portal and how this is changing um, recruiting, let's unpack that a little further and then we'll, we'll come to questions shortly here. Well, there's three things, Mono, that have changed the recruiting landscape. One is the NIL, which is this where your players can get paid in different ways. That's one thing that's changed. But honestly, that's only probably changed at the highest level, like power five schools. You know, that that is significant there. And and that's the name image likeness, NIL, that players can now start to get paid in different fashions. Yep, yeah. Continue. And that's one thing that's changed a, a small percentage. I wouldn't say crazy, but it's changed it for the highest level of basketball. The second thing that changed everything is COVID um, when players ended up getting an extra year and it threw a class behind and it, it's, it's backed things up and players have stayed longer and they have less scholarships to go around. And then, um, and then that contributed probably even directly and, and society has contributed to this too, where the transfer portal has done nothing but grow in leaps and bounds every single year because we're living in a time where most players are changing high schools every couple of years. They're changing AAU teams, uh, sometimes within the same season. Uh, if they're not happy, they're moving and going to the next thing. And so players are leaving at a, at a really, really crazy rate. And to be honest with you, I don't know, we as college coaches know exactly what to make of it because it's a sort of a double-edged sword. Um, you know, everyone's looking in the transfer portal for players that have gone and done something and, and proven themselves somewhere else. And there's a ton of players in our league that have gone from division two to division one. Um, we were fortunate. We had um, an all American, one of the best players in division two, who's going to be a pro basketball player who decided to actually stay, but most players aren't doing that when they're that good. He could have gone to a major school, but he decided to stay. Um, and uh, you know, he, he just out, out of, you know, loyalty or whatever it might be like that's why he decided to stay but then the wrinkle that throws in it to for us 
is many coaches are scared now to sign high school players because let's say they come to my school and they're not good enough and we really improve them over a year or two, right when they get good enough to help us, then they're going to transfer out. So then a lot of coaches are saying, well, why don't I just get them after their transfer rather than get them on the front end? Because most of the time when you go to college, your first year is really hard. You know, not a lot of freshmen have a ton of success. And so it's hard and you go through growing pains and you went from playing every minute of the game to maybe not getting but a couple of minutes. And so the next year you kind of get your feet under you, you start playing, you have a good year and then you're like, all right, now I'm out. So coaches are thinking, man, we just invested two years and now they're out of here. So now coaches are asking, is it even worth it? Maybe we should just get them on the rebound. And everybody's sorting through it a different way. You know, if I, I could tell you what we're doing, but that wouldn't matter because there's a lot of coaches doing it a lot of different ways. Um, but everybody's a little bit confused and, and there's probably more better high school players sitting out right now in the 2022 class. And this will happen in 23 and 24 than there has ever been in, in, in my history of, you know, 21 years of coaching college basketball. I've never seen this many good high school players sitting out there on, on, uh, on almost June one uh, waiting for this next year's class. And so it is, it is, is definitely a different landscape. That's really helpful. And for, for many parents and players, they might find this discouraging as well, TJ. I mean, that's difficult to hear that the opportunities, there's more players and there's fewer opportunities. So that's a tough spot to be in. I, I think of um, one of our multi-time PGC grads, RJ Taylor, number one point guard in the state of Michigan this past year. And uh, it was made, made a few calls to some division one coaches that I know on RJ's behalf, uh, because he's just an outstanding player, but he's undersized. He's undersized, but he not only did he get good, but then he found all the ways to get an edge. Um, and uh, certainly PGC supported his journey in that respect. And he became the number one player in the state. And he just signed with Northern Iowa. And I'm really happy for him. But when I was speaking with his dad, his dad said, you know, we just considered ourselves fortunate to get him a spot as good as he is, because the opportunities are just that few. And he was undersized. And as we know, you know, it's just harder if you're undersized. But we have a lot of players that attend PGC who are undersized. We teach them how to play bigger than their size. But on paper, that can be a... a a difficult hurdle to overcome. So let's go to this third and final piece before we open things up for questions. And that is really simply exposure and contact. What can parents and players to do, do despite this landscape to position themselves to be able to have a shot? So what recommendations would you give? Because, there, and, and then we'll talk about how early is too early, how late is too late because I know there's many on this call that they just want, they just want the, okay, now I understand all of that. What can I actually do? And I coached a U17 team and nearly every parent wanted their, to see their kids play college basketball. And they were regularly asking me, Mono, what can we do? So let's talk about that exposure, TJ. What can these, uh, these parents and players do? And what can recommendations can our coaches in our PGC community give to their players to help them get just the best shot and the best look possible. Yeah, and so I've got a lot of things, Mono. I, I want to go back to the first one is, you know, just helping your kids to get better as they grow. You know, like if they're good enough in eighth grade to, you know, go to an exposure tournament and get seen and get ranked and whatever, they're going to be good enough in ninth grade, 10th grade, 11th grade. Like what, what's the point? Like they're not going to make their decision at that point anyways. And so, spend all of that time getting getting that grade. Now, when you get into high school and when you get into, you know, perhaps like, you know, going into 10th grade, going into 11th grade, there is, um, there is value in going to some of these tournaments to get seen. Yeah. Now, there's a problem, you know, like for me, I, it's different for everybody, but three to four a summer or fall is enough for us to keep a healthy family balance, to spend good time with our family, to spend time at home working on our game and doing that. And all you need to do is be good enough one time and get seen one time. And so just because you go to 25, 30 tournaments or 50 tournaments over your career, it doesn't matter. Volume is not it. It's getting seen by the right person at the right time. And you have to be out there a few times to be able to get seen. 
but when you're good enough, they'll find you, you know, they will, they will without a doubt, find you the internet, like it's changed the way we recruit, changed the landscape of that. So there, th that number one is just get good enough. The second one is, is playing in some exposure. You do want to see that. And, um, you do want to get out there occasionally and, and be at those events and just picking the right events and making sure that you're on a team if you're going to do that, uh, where it, they play a healthy amount of tournaments where you're not playing 18 tournaments. You're not going to, they just play, you know, a couple tournaments and you're doing other things to improve your game and they're getting you to the right tournaments. I think that's really important. Um, and outside of that, uh, there's a whole bunch of other things that I think people don't know that I think are super valuable. Um, you know, I think at any time you could go and watch a practice or, or get invited to go see a practice or ask if you can just come see it, like just to see the level, like we talked about, that's really important. But then there's this whole nother level of how do I contact these people? Like, how do I get there? Where, how do high school coaches, should I use a service? Should I do? And there's a whole bunch of different things that you can do to make contact with coaches. And I think it's important um, to know how to do that, but I also think it's important to do it right. And I'd like to spend some time talking about how to do it right, Mono, if that's okay. Let's do that. Can I ask one question? Yeah. I've never asked you this question before. Curious to know what you would say if, as a college coach and what you think many others would say. If th that idea of watching a college practice if, if a player or parent was reached out to you or one of your assistant coaches, and instead of trying to say, hey, will you recruit, my, will you recruit me? Here's a video. If they said, hey, we're, we're attempting to identify what level, um, you know, our, our child that could play at or what level I could play at. And I'm wondering if I could come watch one of your practices just to really get an understanding of, uh, of the level of play and what's required, um, especially from a, just a day-to-day -day work perspective. Would many coaches open the door and would that, would that uh, open the door to being able to go and see? <laughs> at least at minimum, you're getting in front of somebody. What are your thoughts on that? And have you ever had a player do that? Yeah, a, a couple. You know, and Sam Allen, one of our directors, you know, he coaches some travel ball. And one of the things that he's done is bring his entire team up almost every year to watch us practice to help them understand where they fit. I think it's mm -hmm. What a great thing for a coach to do. I always thought that that was just uh, every every team should do this. They should go watch a practice to see where I fit. And um, yeah, I mean, there's different rules. And so uh, some of it will depend on their age. How old are they? Are they a recruitable athlete? But you can always take unofficial visits. And so they just have to do the paperwork for the unofficial visit. But I do think most coaches, when approached like that, I'm trying to identify what level they want to play at. I think there's a lot of coaches that would allow players and parents to come watch a practice. I mean, we allow people in all the time and I hear coaches say all the time, our practices are open to people at every single level. I hear that. And so I think there would be a lot of accommodating coaches. It's also a good way to make a good contact and a good connection. Yeah. Great way to make a, a contact and connection. And to our coaches on tonight's call, I think that's a great idea, TJ, just hearing that uh, PGC director, Sam Allen does that and brings them to your practices. You know, if you're coaching a team, Coach, take uh, some of your players who want to play college basketball and go ask to go watch, uh, you know, an, an NAIA team practice and a Division One team practice or a Division Three team, and let your guys get introduced to different levels of play. When before I had considered Canadian University basketball, I knew nothing about Canadian University basketball. It would have been really helpful to have gone and watched a practice and gone, "Wow, this is actually legit." I didn't know it was legit. I just looked at division one games on TV and thought that was the only legit level of play. So I think that's a terrific idea and uh, an easy one for any parent or player or coach. You might have to knock on five doors to get an open door, but that would be well worth it to just create a connection. Okay. Let's jump into how to do it right. And maybe we can talk about some of the specifics about how, how to reach out to a coach, what to, uh, what to share, what to send, how long a video. Let's talk about those things. Yeah. So I think this would be helpful for players, coaches, and parents on, on how to send a good one. Because first of all, you have to understand the volume of emails we get. I coach at a division two college and we get hundreds and hundreds of emails every single week. And I'm talking, you know, an occasional week, sometime over a thousand emails we will get in one week. And these come from you know, recruiting services, they come from high school coaches, travel coaches, the player themselves, transfers, prep schools, JUCOs, like every, every, you're just getting 
tons of emails. And so if, if you put yourself in the spot of a coach, you know, how do I actually go through all this? And we have a system with my staff on how we, you know, kind of divvy those out. But I can also tell you, there's a large percentage that will get deleted right away. There is a percentage that will stop at my desk because something caught my eye. And there's a percentage that will get filtered out to my assistants to hopefully go through when time permits, but they have a job I and mean, we've got phone calls to make, we've got practices to run, you get, you know, and so, you know, you're getting hundreds of emails, it, not everyone gets seen, not everyone gets through. And so, you know, there's, I could go on for a long time about this, but I'm gonna try and hit the highlights of some things that I think are really, really important. Um, so the first thing I would say is your tagline. I mean, it's just like any other email. Um, if I see a tagline that says, recruit me, that's not very interesting. And if I see a tagline that says, I want a scholarship. Yeah, not very interesting. Not a really good way to start it. But if I see something that says six foot one point guard, 4.0 GPA, 42% from the three point line. Hmm, interesting enough, right? I'm not even saying that's the winner, but yeah. interesting enough, 4.0 GPA, that tells me right off the bat, they won't even cost me a full scholarship because many people understanding this, like, it's much like a salary cap to at a lot of schools. So for instance, if I see a kid that's in the state of Georgia with a 4.0, I know right off the rip, my school is going to give them X number of dollars. The Hope Scholarship is going to give them X number of dollars. And before I even open the email, if this kid's any good, he's only costing me half a scholarship, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and, and so that, that means something to me. And um, you know, and if your GPA is not too high, you probably don't want to put in there 2.2 GPA. You might want to, you want, want to bury that one a little bit. You might want to, you, but the highlights, something that's going to catch their attention of, of what may stand out about your son or your daughter, I think is really important. So that tagline uh, needs to be good. Um, and then you know, the second thing is this, if it is sent to 484 different people, then I don't, I think it's just, if you're fishing. And so I'm definitely, I might even delete it. I might pass it on, but when it's to the masses, it's not a great chance that I'm going to get, it, read it. If the tagline was good and it said, Hey, coach Rosine, I'm like, wow, they took enough time to, to find my name, right? Like I'm probably give it a little bit of time. Mm -hmm. If there was any kind of connection you know, my son or daughter or, or, or my friend went to a manual or I heard about a manual from so-and-so or I do, I'd be like, okay, well, this is somebody that I, I probably need to contact back. It might not be immediate, but I probably need to contact it back because they identified a connection between us, something mm -hmm. that, that may matter. It wasn't just in bulk and, and it wasn't just all about them. They made some kind of connection. Um, next thing, and I'm just rattling off a bunch of bullet points here, Mona, so hopefully people are yeah. getting these notes here, but um the next thing is, if I look at this email and it looks like a novel, I'm thinking, I don't have time to do this. You know, I usually allot twice a day, 22 minutes to look through my recruiting emails. And so that might even get me through a third of them, of the ones I get on that day. And so it, it's got to be good. And I'm not going to have time to read a novel because that's going to take my entire 22 minutes. Mm -hmm. so I'm looking for bullet points and highlights. I just want to know. And honestly, even if you give me the bullet points and there's a click to the video, I'm probably going to go skip the bullet points and go to the video. And if I like the video, I'll go back and read the bullet points. So I want to easily access, access your video. I'm going to move on to the video. You don't want to bury the lead right off the rip. I'm not going to watch a 10 minute video. If the first minute doesn't catch my attention, first 30, 45 seconds, I'm probably forwarding it on to one of my assistants or moving on. So in the first couple of highlights, you know, yes, and passing is really important. And I'd like to see that in the fifth minute that your player can make some reads, but I don't want to see in the first minute. I want to see what they can, they can do with the ball. And then we will dig deeper. You got to give me a re reason to dig deeper. I might dig deeper and find out later. Well, they actually don't play that hard on defense. That highlight film was just them scoring. I, I'm going to dig deeper. I'm going to ask for games. I'm going to ask for practices you know, or different things that I might want to see as a coach, but you, you don't want to lose me early. You don't want to lose any coach early, you know? And, and so um, you want to grab that attention. You want to put all that stuff that they're beginning. So, you know, Mono, at a high level, like there's some things I think that are just really important bullet points um, to try and get your email read. Even that doesn't guarantee your email gets read, 
but those are some things that'll make it more likely to get read. That's really helpful. Uh, you, you said don't lose them early. How long should that video be? So if, uh, if a parent or coach is planning on putting together a video to send to, uh, to a college coach. Yeah. You know, honestly, if three minutes, if I've watched three minutes and it's enough to get my attention, I'm not going to offer you a scholarship on a 10 minute video. Like I'm going to, I'm going to dig deeper. I'm going to get to know you. I'm going to watch the video. So, you know, I mean, three minutes is good for me. If you went five or six, fine. Um, I don't know if I've ever watched a 10 minute video because if in the first two minutes they weren't good enough, I didn't watch the last eight minutes. And if the first two to three minutes, they were good enough, we were picking up the phone. Or <laughs> you we were were calling. Phone, you know? So yeah, yeah. So <laughs> that fifth to six minutes, I don't know what happens to it, but I might go back and watch it later, find out the player has interest. I'll rewatch the video a couple of times, but you know, I think three to five minutes is plenty of time for that video to be. All right. You gave lots of nuggets. I, I wrote them down. I'm going to recap them in just a, a minute or two here, but there's something that you want, you touched on when you talked about personalizing the email that I just want to speak to and want to just help brainstorm with you how a parent or a coach or a player can increase their likelihood. This is, it reminds me of, you know, one of my sons is trying to get a, a, a summer job right now. And it's often who you know, and you mentioned in the email, you know, if you can cite that, uh, you know, so-and-so suggested you reach out. So let's talk about that because from my experience, you know, you can go play in a hundred AU tournaments and not get noticed. But if you've got somebody who can put in a good word for you, and I know that because I've called coaches on behalf of lots of PGC grads or kids that I coach and they're going to pick up the phone if I call them because I'm in a relationship with them. And if I say, I got a kid and he's the hardest worker I've coached, the hardest working kid I've coached in 10 years, and he can, he's got a motor, he can go, or he's a phenomenal shooter and he's, he's going to be a really good next level player. You want to see this kid. I mean, that's going to go way further than showing up at five AU tournaments. So let's just uh, spitball this and brainstorm here. How can a, a typical parent or player increase their odds of knowing somebody who might be able to help open a door? Yeah, that's a good question. I, one thing I would add to that is, I mean, think six degrees, you know, like even if you make a, a distant connection to something for me, you know, like, um, Man, I had the chance to watch Emmanuel play two years ago on on a, on, a, on a highlight film, or I got to. It's, it's it's distant, right? Like we don't actually know each other. Like that's probably not the strongest one, but even that kind of connection would make me think. Well, they know something about us. Now, my brother attended Emmanuel. That's a whole nother. That's even a, a a bigger connection. Or you know, if Mono calls me and say, "Hey, I've watched this kid play down the street." Well, that's even a bigger connection. So I think there's different levels to it. I think you want to make some kind of connection you can, but you're right. I mean, increasing your opportunity to make those connections, I think is, is a great idea. Yeah. I, I just thought of uh, something PGC founder Dick DeVenzio mentions in one of his books. He talks about the value of impressing a referee or impressing another team's coach and treating them well. You know, we always think, ah, oh, my coach isn't doing anything for me. You know, my high school coach, I asked him if he could help me get uh, get recruited. And he's like, yeah, I'll make some calls. And he never made some calls. And I, I, was, I was a bit frustrated that he didn't take, do anything on, on my behalf at the time. But how you show up with referees, referees a lot of times are former players or they have friends who are coaches and they know people. Other coaches in your conference, even if your coach doesn't know somebody, Chances are another coach in your conference does and treating them well, you know, shaking hands with good eye contact after the game or introducing yourself before the game or thanking a referee uh, before and after a game. Those things at minimum will never hurt and at maximum could help uh, open a door for you. What are your thoughts on that, TJ? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I it, it, to be honest with you, the way that I, I went to my first college scholarship and the team got in trouble, I told you about. And so then it was late and it was the team that we beat in the region championships coach who had a player at that school that told the coach about me. Hmm. And that's how they picked me up late, you know? And so like th that, like those things go, and to be honest with you, 
I would probably be more impressed, not if your high school coach called me, but another high school in your region called me. And so like high school coaches that are on here, if you ever had a, a another coach that's in your region that you really trust that you're friends with, and you were to have them send me an email about a player, or you send an email about one of their players, like those kind of connections go a long way. And little things like that, Mono, like people don't recognize they get noticed. I read a, a great book about it one time from a sports agent that said the majority of jobs, and he had statistics on it, the majority of jobs are actually landed uh, by somebody in your closest six people. Hmm. And so like a lot of even college jobs were not landed, college coaching jobs were not even landed by, you know, somebody that they worked for, somebody, whatever, it was their brother that knew somebody there. It was their somebody that knew somebody, whatever. So yeah, yeah. and why not just open up the floodgates by building those types of connections with that type of eye contact, shake a hand, get to know people, love it. Yeah, and, and that would go for a, a high school coach as well then. If a high school coach on tonight's call feels like, well, I don't really know many college coaches. I'd love to be able to put a phone call in the way, the way you guys can and, and, you know, a division one coach is going to pick up the call, but if you're a high school coach or an AU coach on tonight's call, you could ask, as you said, TJ, another coach in your conference. Hey, I'm just wondering who, you know, because I think Susie can, can play at the next level, but I don't really know who to call. So, you know, tap into the coaches that, you know, cause within two or three degrees of separation, somebody knows somebody. Yeah, for sure. I'll just add one more. You never know who might be in the stands. I was playing pickup ball in the summer in high school. And I didn't know there was, there was a, a guy in a wheelchair watching, had no idea that he was a high school coach in Detroit. And he saw how hard I played in a pickup game in the summer and said, do you want to come over to Detroit and start playing with a lot of top players? And he brought me over and I started going to this Coleman Young Community Center named after the mayor of Detroit. And he brought me in there every weekend to train TJ. It didn't get me a college scholarship, but it made me a whole lot better and prepared me to, to get noticed. But I had no idea. It was summer and it was, it was a, a pretty empty gym. So my encouragement to players is you never know who you might be playing in front of and who you might be able to impress that might be able to pick up the phone or, or do something good to help your cause. Yeah. And I could go on and on about those stories. I have a, a former player that's an assistant at University of Buffalo right now at a, at a Division I school. And he was on vacation in Hilton Head from Buffalo when he was in the parking lot doing ball handling at one o'clock in 100 degree weather. My dad was on a, My dad walked outside his front door and saw him and said, any kid that's out here in 100 degree weather doing ball handling, I want to meet. He met him, ended up getting a scholarship to play for him, just a, that type of coincidence. And I've got endless number of stories like that. So you never know. So, so you create opportunities by how you show up every day, players. So while it might seem daunting to get, uh, how am I going to get a, a scholarship? How am I going to create opportunities? I play in a small town. I don't, I don't get exposure. I don't have a coach who can get me somewhere. How you show up every day matters. It doesn't guarantee you an opportunity, but it certainly increases your chances. TJ, let's recap, and then we're going to go to questions. And we're one minute away from finishing this webinar, but we got to do some questions. Uh, but the Mavs and Warriors are about to tip off, and I know we don't want to keep everybody from getting, uh, getting to that game, but I do want to answer questions. So to recap what we covered tonight, Number one, get good before you get seen. Number two, get an edge. Find those intangibles that can help make you stand out. Obviously, PGC is known for helping those helping players get those intangibles, helped me to get those intangibles. I learned how to play bigger than my size and ended up having the opportunity to play college basketball. Thousands of other players have experienced that same thing. We would love to help you if you're a player or a parent of a player who's dedicated and wants to play in college. If you haven't gotten to PGC or you attended PGC previously, come back with us. Uh, number three, go watch a practice. And if you're a coach, take your players to watch a practice. Number four, reach out strategically. Reach out strategically. So here's what I wrote down as my notes that, uh, that I had from you, TJ. Communicate the high points. 
especially in the subject title and early on. Keep your email short. Personalize the email. Don't just send out a mass email to 100 coaches. Personalize it. Learn something about the coach or their program, at minimum their name. Next, include your best attributes, whether that's your academic average or your points per game or shooting percentage, include your, or your, that you're six foot eight, include your best attributes and highlights first in that short email. And then in your video, keep it short, doesn't need to be longer than three minutes and don't lose them early. Show your best highlights and best attributes first. TJ, you packed a lot into our time. So as we say at PGC Snaps is our way of acknowledging. I just want to acknowledge you for packing so much into this time. And I know so many players and parents and coaches were impacted the first time around. I know many more will be with this webinar. I want to wrap up the official time here on the hour. But for those of you that want to stick around, TJ, if you're willing, would love to do an open Q&A for maybe another 10, max 15 minutes. Are you open to that, TJ? I'm sensitive yeah. to your time. No, that's good. Uh, I'm happy to do that. All right. Uh, I will keep the recording going just for, uh, as, as I know, many, many more, hundreds more are going to listen to the recording of this call after the fact. So for those of you who do, do decide to jump off now, want to encourage you to... Uh, uh, to put into practice all of those different pieces and coaches, hopefully you have some tools in your tool belt now to go back to your players and support your players as well. Would love to continue to support you on your journey. Coaches, joining us as an observing coach this summer. Can't think of anything more impactful. TJ and I have both done it as coaches prior to getting involved with PGC ourselves, Join us, joining us as an observing coach. And players would love to have you at the Playmaker College, Scoring College, or Point Guard College, a five-day, four-night camp. We've already registered at nearly 11,000 players and coaches and many camps have already sold out. So I'm going to type into the chat box while you answer the first question here, TJ, the link to our website. And for coaches, I'll put in the coaches page. If you haven't reserved a spot at a summer camp, come be our guest. We will send you home a better student of the game, a better leader, and better positioned to maximize your potential and reach your dreams. And I can never guarantee this, but I, I will say, we have had a lot of PGC grads talking about making contacts and making connections who have made a connection with an instructor or even our PGC director. And that's opened a door for them because they've made a call on their behalf when they've stood out of the session. And so I think PGC can just be another great place and great environment to make strategic connections that can help fulfill dreams. TJ, let's go ahead and jump into the Q&A box and answer some of these questions. Yeah, um, so I'm going to rapid fire some of these right here. Um, if you have a question, put it in the Q&A box, not the chat box, if you don't mind, because it's just hard to go back and forth between. Put it in the Q&A box. But I'm going to read a couple from both really quickly. Uh, what would you recommend to high school coaches since it sounds like the transfer portal is hurting high school athletes? What do you do? Number one, tell them to keep their options open. They need an opportunity and, and you can't just think too big. They need an opportunity. And so, uh, you know, there's there's prep school opportunities, there's JUCO opportunities, there's lower level opportunities. Like tell them not to close doors. That's the most important thing that I would do and tell them not to give up on it because the, the cycle is behind. There's still a lot of scholarships out there even right now in this summer and there will be in June, there will be July. The process has been backed up because of the transfer portal. High school players are getting talked to later and later. I know that doesn't help parents, doesn't help coaches, but tell them just to keep working, to keep going after it. So that's a couple things that I would recommend for, for high school players. Hey, when is too late? Uh, Lisa asked this to commit. Their daughter went on, on a visit. They liked it. When you know it's the right place, commit. I mean, when you know, that's when it's the right fit and you know, and if you feel like there's not, then then I'd say keep your interest level there, keep the contact. But um, yeah, I, I don't think it's ever the wrong time to commit if you think it's the right level, the right fit and all that type of stuff for you. Um, what is a typical normal expiration time on an offer? Donovan asked. Donovan, that is going to vary from coach to coach, from school to school. And um, it is, that's where the business gets ugly. The offer's there till the offer's not there. And so they're going to court you and tell you all the different things. And all of a sudden, if they find a better player or somebody else and they sign them, and that scholarship's gone. I see it happen all the time. And so um, hopefully coaches are telling you and they're being transparent. And we have our way of doing it and telling them, we tell them at the end of this time, 
you know, we're going to both be, if you're, if you're still dating, we're still dating. That's a common term for us. Um, and so we let coach, but I don't know that I would say a lot of coaches don't do that. They don't, they say, yeah, it's your offer. It's your offer. And they'll pull. So you've got to be careful. Um, and that's in that scenario, what's the percentage of playing versus training? Would you recommend, um, skill development that look age and stage, more training, more developing more, right. And there, look, a good coach is going to have you playing in there, playing in the gym anyway. You're going to be in a three-on-three, -three, a four-on-four setting. They're going to have you playing within the workouts. And so that's what you're going to get in a good session anyway. If you were to come to one of our PD said there's a ton of training, a ton of learning, but we're always ending with some sort of play, some sort of game that makes you better. And that's what a good coach uh, will do. There, there'll be enough good play. In the travel team I'm coaching, I said, listen, I don't even want to go to any of these tournaments. You can go play in two or three of them if y'all want to play. I'm not even going to coach them. Somebody else can coach them because I'm not even going to go. But here's what we're going to do. They're going to have plenty of games that we're going to play within that practice that are going to make them better, better than they're actually going to get on that weekend. Um, but I, there's no exposure, you know, in, 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 in my gym. But, yeah, they can go to a couple of them. So I would just say – age stage um just keep getting better keep getting better and keep getting better um and then as you get a little bit older then yeah playing some tournaments it, most of the time it's just done way too high. you know 14 tournaments in a summer 15 tournaments like what well, i mean if you got that kind of cash it, I, I wouldn't recommend wasting it um it, because it is sometimes a drain um next one if college camps are um, a way to get recruited this is an interesting one um there every camp serves some sort of purpose you know, like at our PGC sessions, we're not free there for you to get recruited. We're there to get you better. But the reality of it is our directors and our, our staff and everybody, they're, they're college coaches, they're high school coaches, they're college players. They know people. There's plenty of connections to be made at a PGC, but we're not promoting that you're going to, that's what we're doing is exposure. If you're to go to a specific camp at a, at a college where it's a, um, an elite camp and they're inviting kids for them, I'll be honest with you. We do one, we try and limit it. We try and do it really well. It is a way for assistant coaches to make some money. It is a way for us to get a mass number of kids in there. And we do occasionally sign one or two kids out of those 60 or 70 players, um, but not every single time. And so it's both. I mean, I, I wouldn't call them scams, um, those elite camps, but you do have to be careful. You want to know the level of interest of the, of the people that have invited you to it. Um, and sometimes if it's, you know, 60 bucks, 75 bucks, and you're willing to pay that because you want to get seen and it's worth the risk for you, then it's not the worst deal to go to go take that chance. But it's not a guarantee that you're going to get seen there. And then as far as college summer camps, I, I don't think that's a way to get recruited. Most college summer camps are a way to kind of make money, expose their school and all that kind of stuff. But they'll find you another way. I don't think most people do that. We don't do them hoping that players are going to come that we're going to recruit. I don't think a lot of colleges um, uh, do. Um, so if coaches are overlooking high school prospects, I kind of answered that one, stay the path, you know, JUCO and prep schools are both options, but I, you know, don't give up on whatever you think might be the right fit or right level, like keep going for that. But, you know, also you might not get the exact opportunity you want and you got to keep going. And you've heard that story a thousand times where people just made the best of what they had and they kept going. So, you know, I think any of those directions can be op options uh, for your player, Don. Don also asked, what's the best day of time? to send emails to coaches the best time of year. You know, I would say best day and time. Uh, you know, a lot of us go in there Monday morning getting ready to work. And if it pops up or comes out, it's going to be front of mind, right? And if you send it Saturday afternoon, it might get buried into my 300th email by the time I get back to work Monday. So I, I think like a lot of emails, early Monday, um, early in the day, Tuesday or Wednesday, right? When somebody gets into the office, eight, nine o'clock in the morning is always a good time. Maybe send a little earlier, six, seven, comes across your desk, you're kind of thinking about things, that would be my recommended time. I don't know if there's any perfect time to send an email, but that would be probably the closest or best guess that I could give you. Um, uh, let's see here. Uh, what type of questions should you ask before you commit to a school? Great, great question. If you are actually in the process of getting to know people and getting to know coaches, um, the questions that you're asking are driving towards what we talked about earlier. Is this a good fit for me? And you need to know what a good fit for you is. For me, I played for my dad, who was a super transformational coach. And it meant a lot for me. I'm, I'm a big team guy. And I went to a place that was transactional. 
And I didn't know it at 18, but that wasn't going to work for me. I had to play for somebody I believed in. That may not be everybody's case, but you're going to want to get to know that staff. You're going to want to ask them hard questions. Look, if you want to say, how much playing time am I going to get? Honestly, if they give you an answer, I'd probably say they're lying because who knows, you know? I mean, who knows? Like those questions don't help. Um, you might ask, you know, if, if there's an offensive system you think you might fit in. Um, you know, what do you value in my son or daughter? What do you see that, that that's really good in them? What do you think they need to work on? Um, I'm asking for honest feedback. Like if I want to be a good player, you know, how hard do you think they play? Like I, I ask tough questions. Don't ask the questions everybody else asks. Ask ones that make you stand out a little bit. Um, the, the feeling of somebody says, what do you, what do we need to improve on? What do we need to work on? Like that tells me you want to get better, you know? And I, and I don't even know if I'd ask that as a parent, I'd have my child ask that if, if they're up for it and they believe in that. Um, because you're going to need to know, is this place going to fit me? And there might be a myriad of other things that fit you that don't fit me. You know, class size might matter to you. Safety of the campus might matter to you. There's a whole bunch of things that might matter. And so whatever is the best fit for you, I think those are really um, important things um, to ask when you're going through the process. Um, yeah, so... Uh, it, the contact periods, Charles asked, what are the contact periods? And that, that varies. Like we have a calendar as a coach that this is a dead period and we can't be out visiting you at your place, but you can come to our place or it's a, it's a, it's a quiet period and we can't do these certain things, but throughout the year, pretty much any time we can have contact uh, with players. And then there's different, every level has different uh, running. Most of them, like division two, division three, a lot of them have gone to, you can offer scholarship and accept any single time. Um, signing days are still kind of there in division one, just for press and release. And there's the official day you can sign, but there's, there's a variety at every other level of when you can sign. But most of the time there can be contact year round. DJ, I know you just banged out a lot of uh, a lot of questions in a really short period of time, and I'm sure these questions could go on and on. Uh, to all of our coaches joining us tonight, a part of our PGC community, I'm going to just type into the chat box. If if you've enjoyed everything you've learned from TJ, our PGC coaching club and mentorship program that TJ spearheads along with several other PGC directors you got to come be a part of our PGC coaching community um, led by TJ. You can learn from TJ all year, every year, um, and, uh, and benefit from all the resources that he's created to serve and support you. So that's pgccoaching.com. And uh, TJ, just before we wrap up, any final closing thoughts to, uh, to, to our parents, coaches, players joining us tonight? Yeah, you know, I mean, this one's just really, you know, dear to my heart. I appreciate you asking um, because I, I, you know, I've learned a lot. Just I've coached at every level of basketball. I mean, coaching my seventh grade daughter now, and I'm, I'm watching and I'm, I'm seeing the view from the parents and like some of the things that they're thinking and what I'm hearing. And, you know, I think it's just the reminder that um, basketball is a game. Now it's the greatest game on earth, but it's a game. And, um, when we get overindulged in these types of things and it's all about getting recruited and it's all about the scholarship and it's all about that we miss some of the great things the game of basketball has to teach us and we forget to enjoy it we forget to enjoy watching our child play we forget to enjoy playing the game as a player we forget to we forget to enjoy coaching the game as a coach and so uh so many times it's all about this end journey of did they get the scholarship did they get whatever but look it's like it's kind of like retirement you can spend 40 years working so that you can retire at, at 70 and enjoy it for five years what about the 40 years you spent working there needs to be some enjoyment in that work there needs to be some impact there just like in your playing career and so look there's nothing wrong with playing college basketball it's great and as many people that can play i would love to see play not everybody's dream does come true um, but for a long period of time, as you're growing up, you get to play the greatest game on earth and, and you as a parent get to watch them, you as a coach get to coach them, you as a player get to play it. And don't miss those days. Uh, don't let them go by because there's something off in the distance you're looking at. Um, don't forget to enjoy the game.